So very good morning to all of you. I, Dr. Anil Kumar, would like to invite all on the behalf of organizing committee for your active participation in first session of ninth day of faculty development program entitled Cinema Society and Education organized by Atma Ram Sanatan Dham College collaborated with uh, TLC Center Ramanaja College. So I would like to introduce our first speaker of today's session, Dr. Rashmi Sone. She is Bangalore-based culture theoretist and associate professor in film and culture study at Chris University. She wrote many beautiful works on cinema and virtual arts in English and Marathi and has published in various international books and journals. She had worked as an editor for many books like Women's at Work, The Culture and Creative Industry, South Asian Artists, Films and Videos, Science and Speculated Fiction, and many more. So with that, I would like to invite our creative speaker, Dr. Rashmi Sone, for the talk based on science fiction and cinema. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Kalotra, for the very generous introduction. I hope I'm audible. I think that's yes, a mandatory sentence everybody <laughs> has to articulate now before we start. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this FDP uh, very generously, Dr. Maitre Roy Chaudhary, for reaching out and asking me to speak at this uh, gathering. It's uh, strange to be speaking at a virtual gathering, though we've all got used to it now, one year of teaching online. Uh, and I'm just happy to be you know, able to see at least some of your faces. Uh, so do those of you who can, please do leave your videos on. Of course, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's entirely up to you. Uh, so when Maitri asked me to speak about something at this uh, FDP, uh, you know, we were kind of discussing various options because as Dr. Kalotra mentioned, my work has spanned uh, very different uh, arenas. In, in the sense that I've worked on the visual arts and the intersection of cinema and the visual arts, uh, videos and documentary films that are exhibited not in film theaters, but in the museum and gallery space. Uh, I've done quite a lot of work on um, women in cinema and also women in the visual arts. And in fact, my uh, PhD dissertation, which I did many, many moons ago in Ireland, uh, was looking at the early history of uh, women filmmakers in India. Uh, starting with in the 1920s. And this is a lesser known fact. Uh, you know, everybody knows Dada Saheb Falke as the father of Indian cinema, but not many people know of Fatima Begum as the mother of Indian cinema, who was working along with uh, and sometimes also in collaboration with Dada Saheb Falke. I'm not going to be talking about any of that today, though. Uh, I'm going to be talking about science fiction and cinema. Uh, and when I sent my title, Maitri asked me if the, there was supposed to be a comma between science and fiction. And I said, yes, indeed, there is supposed to be that comma. Uh, because what I want to focus on is uh, not science fiction as a genre within cinema, but really uh, the relationship between science and by extension technology. And in a minute, I'll come and kind of talk about the distinction between the two and the relationship of science and technology with forms of representation, particularly lens-based and technological forms of representation, extending into the digital realm, which we are all in today. Uh, so my talk is going to kind of span a very early prehistory of cinema and bring us into the contemporary moment. And I'm going to use science fiction and its relationship and, and cinema really as a as perhaps the uh, medium par excellence that brings together science, technology, and fiction in some sense. Um, so I'm going to be positioning the science fiction cinema as a concept, as a philosophical and technological concept as against uh, 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 you know, a genre that one can look at. And I understand that there are faculty from many disciplines here. So I do hope that we get to have an engaging discussion after I take about 50 or 60 minutes to get through my presentation. It's really an exploratory kind of putting out of some ideas that we hopefully can think through together. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is um, try and make a suggestion that cinema is a consequence of some kind of human desire and the human uh, you know, a wish to represent the world in certain ways. And that this cinema, the technology of cinema and what we call as 
uh, cinematic representation really needs to be understood by locating it within a longer technological history. Uh, and I will begin by making a distinction between science and technology in that science is the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the natural world through observation and experimentation. This is a term that kind of emerges around the mid 14th century. And what is important to uh, lay emphasis on is that it is a systematically organized body of knowledge on something. So in a sense, we are getting to a certain kind of epistemology, a way of organizing things so that it begins to constitute a scientific knowledge. Technology, on the other hand, is a term that is not very old. It's a 17th century term. So in the history of language, uh, you know, it's not such an ancient term. Uh, and technology then comes to be understood as the application of scientific knowledge uh, deriving from the Greek word techne, which actually refers to art or craft and logia, that is systematic treatment. So it becomes a kind of methodological te te you know, uh, techne in some sense. Uh, and I want to point out two or three very important things that were going on when the term, the word technology actually emerges uh, in relation to shift to the scientific experimentation and the technological experimentation that was going on at that time. Um, and these, there are two instruments that I want to draw attention to. One is the telescope and the other is the microscope. So the telescope, uh, you know, as we all know, is kind of a very uh, central element of early science fiction films uh, that, you know, starting with, let's say, uh, George Melier's short film, Trip to the Moon, where, uh, you know, for the first time you have to give some kind of fictional representation as to what the moon might look like. And these are very entertaining and interesting films uh, that Melier makes. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about Melier's film. Uh, so, so the telescope was really, um, you know, kind of, uh, there isn't a single person that one can say is responsible for the development of the telescope, although the credit is often given to Galileo Galilei, who's an Italian astronomer and uh, physicist. And uh, it is considered that Galileo's telescope, which he developed in 1607, became kind of the definitive kind of telescope for some time. Now, um, uh, about three years later, that is in 1610, Galileo also develops a version of the microscope in which he realizes that, or he experiments and discovers that his telescope, which could help us to see things that were very far away, could actually even zoom in and allow us to see things that were, uh, you know, in a very enlarged sense to see uh, in a microscopic way. Um, so I think these two developments are very central to our understanding um, the philosophy of cinema, but also our desire uh, in the invention of cinema itself, which I'm going to link to science uh, fiction in, in a little while. So. The telescope actually, uh, there was a lot of, um, what do you call it, um, um, competition between Holland, and uh, 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 the Netherlands and Italy, as far as scientific development was concerned in the 17th century. Uh, and those of you who may have read Bertolt Brecht's play on Galileo, which is a remarkable play, and um, one of the biographers of uh, 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 Galileo has actually said that Brecht's analysis and understanding of Galileo is far superior then, uh, you know, any other, uh, many other accounts of Galileo that have been um, offered by scientists and historians in some sense. Um, and you will be familiar with, you know, the, the difficulties that Galileo's inventions had caused with the, with the church and all of that. So I'm not going to get into uh, the conflict between religion and technology uh, as it played out in this context. But what I want to point out is that um, this desire to be able to look at things that were very far away and the desire to look at things uh, you know, in such an enlarged way was really a desire for the human being to transcend the physical limitations of the human eye in some sense in that the human eye can only see so far and so close. We can't zoom in, uh, we can't see things in a microscopic way and we can't see things beyond the you know, horizon that uh, is physically possible. For us, and this, I think, I would, you know, uh, uh, try to uh, propose is really the beginning of a certain kind of imaging technology and its advancement, which has taken us or is taking us to its absolute uh, outer limits in this digital context. 
Um, so cinema, when it emerges as the technology of, as a definitive kind of representative technology or technology of representation in the um, later part of the 19th century and definitely the 20th century, is a very specific kind of uh, cinema as we understand it and that we uh, kind of you know popularly allude to when we say film studies or uh, film analysis or film theory uh, and I will get to that what I mean by that in a little while uh, but uh, but I would like to propose that cinema has as we understand it has a lifespan about of about a hundred years and a few more maybe but really we need to understand it in the longer history of the moving image and imaging technologies uh, and including in the digital context. So uh, let me get to the uh, kind of you know, core title of my uh, presentation, which is uh, in some sense about science fiction. Uh, and like I said, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to leverage science fiction to look at larger kind of philosophical issues. So science fiction, as uh, you will all know, it's a, it's a, a genre within literature and cinema. And it's a genre of speculative fiction that typically deals with imaginative or futuristic concepts such as advanced science and technology, space exploration, time travel, parallel universes, extraterrestrial life, uh, attack by aliens, um, you know, uh, issues around memory and consciousness in the more recent contemporary kind of science fiction. And also now uh, questions around artificial intelligence, uh, you know, the relationship between human beings and robots and cyborgs and uh, so on and so forth. So in some sense, science fiction uh, as, as a, let's say uh, for the time being as a genre at least, um, is an invitation for us to imagine that is a world that is human plus plus in the sense that it is a world that consists of humans, but it's also a world that consists of many others uh, which are not quite human. Uh, and therefore it becomes a genre through which one can understand the relationship between what we have historically considered as the human being, that is the mind and the body and the relationship between the mind and the body and those that we consider as other, those that are different from us. Um, and the, the, the relationship between the human self, the human body, uh, the human mind, in relationship to these multiple others, which are both mechanical as well as biological in some sense, uh, in a way redefines who we are as ourselves uh, itself, a, a transforming kind of a human existence. Um, so, so now the irony is that back in the day when we watched Star Wars or you watched, you know, I mean, there's a number of uh, uh, very, very interesting and uh, amusing uh, Indian science fiction films, for example, which were made in the 60s, because this question comes up about whether, you know, science fiction is a genre that is predominantly Western. And there's a very interesting book by uh, 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 Sean Cubitt and Ziauddin Sardar, which is titled Aliens Are Us, which makes an argument that uh, the genre of science fiction is actually a genre that uh, emerges and belongs within the West. And it, it kind of, you know, uh, undertakes a, a post-colonial interpretation of this genre, uh, arguing that uh, everybody who's alien in science fiction is actually the non-white, non-West kind of thing. Uh, it is, of course, a, a contestable argument, uh, but nonetheless, a very interesting argument. And uh, just to take a, a slight detour before I get back to the main emphasis of my presentation is that in 2015, I'd uh, published a special uh, uh, issue of a journal or looking at sa uh, South Asian science and speculative fiction in different um, mediums. So not only film, but literature and theater and radio, which interestingly has been quite a strong uh, space for uh, science fiction in Indian languages. Uh, there is a long history in, uh, in, uh, in Bangla. Uh, and um, some of you may know the story of the a legal battle between uh, uh, Satyajit Ray and, uh, uh, the, you know, in relation to uh, to this film, uh, E.T., the extraterrestrial, where actually, um, you know, it was uh, Ray kind of uh, um, said that the figure of E.T., which is a very popular figure that we all recognize and remember, uh, was actually taken from one of his, his own sketches. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that 
terrain at all. And what I discovered while editing this journal issue was that um, um, in popular Indian cinema, let's say, um, we only start seeing mainstream science fiction films in the mid uh, 1980s with you know things like Mr. India, which is it, it, it's contestable whether it's a science fiction film, but I'm not going to get into those kind of strict definitions and demarcations. And then later the action hero and, you know, all of those kinds of films, Ravan and Robo and so on. But I actually discovered it was a large body of hidden science fiction films, uh, which were B films that were made in the 1960s. And very often these were produced in Madras. Uh, so they, they were Hindi films. Uh, but they were actually produced in Madras. So this is also to say that our association of a particular language to a zone of production um, it really needs quite significant amount of uh, uh, revision in the sense that films in different languages get produced in different places. So, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I find it interesting that this FDP is being conducted in two languages. It's a bilingual FDP. And, you know, the thought occurred to me that Perhaps someday we will actually have a multilingual FDP because we are such a multilingual and multicultural uh, country. So this is uh, very promising in some sense. So I found that these B films that were low budget films had very interesting things to say about uh, our relationship to technology, science and development. Because as you will uh, you know, recollect, uh, the 1960s was also the, the decade of the space race with both America and uh, Russia uh, the, wanting to make it to land on the moon before the other could. Uh, and India, and if you look at the newspapers of the 1960s, there is extensive and regular daily coverage around questions of, uh, is science and technology bad? Uh, is it good for the development of our country? And very often the position that would be taken is, well, it's not science or technology that is per se problematic, but it is the uh, the way in which it is deployed that can be good or bad, uh, in the sense that a nuclear bomb is definitely bad, uh, but a prosthetic limb that could help somebody to walk is not a bad thing at all. So a lot of moral questions begin to be drawn into this discussion around science and technology and its benefit or disadvantage for human society and which were played out in very very interesting ways in uh, in uh, many of these b films of course most of them have been lost because when we do film archiving there's always a value judgment in terms of what is more important to preserve uh, and what is not so important and so therefore you will have the canonical or you know authors films that have been preserved more carefully by the national film archive of india and a lot of the uh, films which are considered as not so important uh, we don't know very much about. So when I did my research in, on, on this material in the National Film Archive in Pune, uh, all I could really find were some stills, some media reportage, very little, uh, and some scripts, because as you know, that all um, film scripts have that, you know, have been passed by the censor board have to be deposited in the film archive. So I actually found scripts, uh, many of them sometimes written in Devnagri, um, with very technical descriptions of scenes. And in one of the films, uh, this is, uh, 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 sorry, forgetting the name of the film, will come back to me in a second. Um, there was a almost 11 minute sequence describing a trip to outer space using uh, terms that were actually drawn from, let's say, uh, you know, film theory as it was unfolding in Russia. So terms like montage or different kinds of, uh, uh, you know, camera angles. And it was very, very fascinating for me to see that um, there was actually a very uh, developed film knowledge, uh, developed kind of vocabulary of film technology that was being used in these scripts. Um, and the only other kind of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not making a direct comparison, but those of you who have seen uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey will remember that very strange scene, almost like a 10 minute scene going out into outer space. Uh, you know, it's a hallucinatory kind of scene. Um, and this film uh, that I was, uh, you know, the script that I was looking at kind of almost had a similar Thing. So I, I found that a very fascinating uh, realm in some sense where questions that were not being addressed head on 
by the mainstream films because the other films in the 1960s were the Shami Kapoor films and you know a lot of romance and going into Kashmir and uh, falling in love and sometimes class conflict between uh, the uh, hero and the his love interest or vice versa and so on um, which were not really addressing these questions around science technology development in a head-on way that this body of films was so that was my brief detour uh, I'm going to uh, return to what I was saying earlier in terms of how uh, science fiction as a genre itself kind of, you know, um, is indicative of uh, many human desires to transcend our bodily constraints. So uh, they belong within a long process of disembodiment. Um, and I'll talk about this in a bit where, you know, disembodiment in some sense starts with print technology where the, uh, the, the, the word is disembodied and reprinted on a printed uh, piece of paper. Uh, the pen itself, the instrument with which one can write itself can be seen as one of the early techniques of disembodiment, of externalizing, of uh, elongating human life after it's actually gone because the word of the author remains and you know the author may not be there. Uh, and in that longer kind of journey of uh, disembodiment, one could place things like uh, the, the you know, photographic camera, the cinematic camera, which increasingly uh, locates the human body within time and space. Uh, and I will come back to this because this may need some unpacking and digital technology in some sense is a further pushing along this route of disembodiment uh, to the point that we are not only disembodied, but also uh, dispersed. Uh, and and I, I hope that we can take up some of these points uh, during the discussion. So I will return to what I was talking about in terms of uh, science fiction. And uh, those of you who uh, teach literature, or even those who don't, uh, will know Mary Shelley's uh, remarkable kind of, you know, a landmark uh, piece of work that's Frankenstein, which really kind of concretely seeds the our human fear of uh, desire to create, to become God in some sense, uh, and then the fear of this entity that we have created. So it's a combination of the desire for ultimate power and the fear of uh, being destroyed by this very thing that we have created, right? Um, and I would look at this within contemporary debates around cloning, uh, uh, you know, uh, biomedicine, genetic technology, and so on. Um, I want to mention a couple of works which I think are indicative of this uh, transformation that we were witnessing in the 18th, 19th centuries. Um, Jules uh, Wern's, uh, Wern's stories, which are very um, well-liked and known, Journey to the Center of the Earth, uh, From the Earth to the Moon, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, are indicative of a certain kind of desire to traverse large quantities of space, which of course had started much earlier with the invention of, uh, you know, uh, locomotive mo uh, techn technologies of mobility, uh, ships and, you know, so on. So, um, so the, here comes the human desire to be able to move rapidly, cover large spans of uh, area. And uh, one can think of these in relationship to, um, things like Google mapping or even um, a second life for those of you who have played ever played that game uh, where you actually exist as an alternative entity in a parallel universe. Um, A.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds, uh, I'm sure everybody knows as being a very iconic kind of text and uh, Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World, uh, which really was quite remarkably visionary. It was published in 1932 and during when we had the last phase of the lockdown, looks like we're getting into uh, at least close to another one. Uh, I, I, I think a lot of people had started watching things and reading and I was listening to a lot of audio books, um, you know, while cleaning the house and, you know, to kind of uh, keep oneself alive beyond the uh, mere physical um, acts that one needed to do at that time. And one of the book, uh, books that I was listening to was uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, and it was remarkable how, uh, you know, uh, uncanny some of the things that he was writing about were in the context of our own lives as we live them today. Um, so I want to mention two films in this context. I've, of course, already mentioned uh, Melie's uh, quite remarkable 
work but uh, the one film which is commonly known as amongst the early uh, science fiction full length feature films is fritz lang's this is the german expressionist director fritz lang uh, his film metropolis um, and you know this is really an um, imagination of two worlds the underworld and the world so it's it, it's very much a kind of class conflict uh, text but the film that is uh, lesser known and which precedes lang's film by about 3 years it was made in 1924 um uh, is a film by a russian director called yakov protazanov and the film is called uh, ali ta queen of mars and what i'm going to do now is to show you a, a short clip about 7 8 it's not very short but for let's say 7 minutes 8 minutes long um uh, so that you know you get some uh, idea of the visuality of these kinds of films that were being made in the early decades of the 20th century and before i show you the clip i just want to say for those of you who are familiar with film theory or film history you would be able to identify that the 1920s is um the decade in which there is uh, you know the, the there are a lot of uh, russian filmmakers who are making uh, theoretical arguments around how the cinema actually construct truth what is the best way to represent this external reality right so there were two i mean the most two most obvious arguments is that you interfere as little as you can which is uh, what ethnographic documentary filmmakers observational filmmakers would do for example where you would just place your camera in a certain space uh, i mean i can think of many examples but one to give you would be uh, david mcdougal's films uh, ethnographic films on the dune school where the camera was placed and things were you know the everyday school life was filmed because it was considered that that was the best way to represent reality um orson wells had a different take on this uh, you know in terms of how depth of field the the amount of the external world that you capture is indicative of how realistic cinema is and we don't have time today to get into these different uh, histories or theories but i'm sure many of you are already familiar with these um and in russia the idea of montage as being the way cinema uh, quite uniquely could represent the world uh, through the juxtaposition of two bits where 1 plus 1 added up to more than 2 in some sense and meaning was created from within this space between one frame and the other uh, it was kind of sophisticated theory of uh, cinema and uh, some of the filmmakers one of them was uh, ziga vertov who has made a, the famous film man with a movie camera uh, documentary film and uh, yakov Pro- protazanov was in some sense working look within the uh, genre of science fiction while there was a lot of serious debate going on around film and ideology film and activism how can film construct the ideal citizen uh you know uh, the russian citizen and then later of course this was taken up in the german context with, with nazi germany and so on um and so therefore uh, uh, Prat- uh pratazanov is a very interesting character himself within that context of film history i'm going to try and show you a, a clip and uh, uh, let's see if the screen sharing works mm. Uh, are you able to see my screen if somebody could just help me with how to do this uh ma'am uh do you have that clip downloaded yeah okay so open that clip in any media player first okay and yeah. pause it and now uh, come back to zoom and click on share screen button at the bottom of your screen yeah uh, you will see many windows so the one which is which oh, has yes. your video uh click on that and please uh, press the share sound button 
Okay. Uh, when you click on share screen, there is a checkbox uh, uh, in, in the bottom. You click on that checkbox, share sound, then you screen share. Sorry, just give me a second to figure this out. Are you able to see? Yes. Hear as well? Yes, ma'am. Yes.
Okay, so the proverbial restriction banning of the cases, Madhav Prasad argues. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, I mean, I'm showing you that clip because um, what's very evident is that many of these films were um, filmmakers who were working in collaboration with artists and activists and workers of the time. And, you know, the, if you see the architectural kind of imagination of what uh, this, uh, you know, um, other planet might look like, it actually draws upon the work of constructivist artists who believe that artists were workers and that artists should work with materials of construction, you know, used to use buildings and metal and so on and so forth. Uh, so I won't get into any detailed kind of analysis uh, of the film at all, uh, but I just want to um, return now. I mean, after having shared this early imagination uh, through cinema, some of the things that I think science fiction uh, as a genre, but also the relationship between science and fiction and uh, our human desires in some sense. Uh, let's say, let's call it through cinema, as I have tried to suggest, we need to look at it in a longer historical span, where cinema as cinema itself uh, is, is a form of the 20th century. And some of the things that I want to comment upon is uh, the idea of plasticity that one can engage with through this kind of exploration of science, technology, fiction, and other representative forms. This is the plasticity of time, space, and vision. So vision, as we saw at length, in terms of how do you extend human vision beyond its actual physical uh, capacity, right? So technologies intervene. Uh, how do we change our experience of time? And you know, we've all commonly read and heard and said and experienced more so in the last few years that uh, with technologies of communication, our sense of understanding experience of time changes because I can pick up the phone, sorry, uh, you know, I, I can kind of uh, coexist in, in simultaneously uh, with somebody who is actually in a very different time zone. And therefore that also links to our experience of space in the sense that we can be in real time. Uh, there may be, I'm here sitting in Bangalore, some of you are in Delhi, other people are in, you know, could be anywhere, Calcutta, uh, Chennai and so on. So, uh, so we know this, this is kind of our lived experience now of how time, space and vision are plastic and that means they're malleable, they can be stretched, they don't need to be, uh, um, they don't need to be representative of what we have historically considered as some kind of reality or uh, the coordinates of time and space. Uh, in a Descartian sense, within which we have located the human being as a thinking mind with a body, right? So in some sense, that earlier understanding of that proposed by Descartes, I think therefore I am and I exist within a time and space uh, coordinates uh, has hugely changed, um, right? So this is one thing that I want us to kind of maybe hold on to. Uh, then the idea of surveillance, and you will know Jeremy Bentham's work with the Panopticon, uh, even before that there is kind of a history to this, uh, the telescope allowing us to look out and see things that, you know, uh, people who are actually in those other spaces and sites do, don't know that they're being watched, like in Alita, you know, they say that they, they believe that they can see the earth, uh, and they can see the earth, but the earth, people on the earth don't know that they're being watched, and people vice versa, people on the earth try to um, look at other uh, spaces. So um, our consciousness of the universe, right? In the sense, which I mentioned already earlier, that we coexist with other planets, other beings, other forms of life, and that we aren't really at the center of the universe. And I think this goes back to, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 my initially kind of beginning with, Galileo and who was very influenced by Copernicus, who had, of course, dispelled many of our arrogant uh, assumptions about the earth being at the center of the universe and human beings at the, beings, being at the center of everything. Um, it, so all of these ideas compel us to think in newer, different ways about human relationships, whether these are biological relationships, uh, if artificial insemination and you know uh, test tube babies are now possible we've already cloned dolly the sheep uh, what is the place of uh, reproductive abilities uh, will the family and social system remain the same if we actually don't you know the 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 the, uh, the objective of 
the uh, normative family is not to bear babies, um, male babies, let's say in our country, uh, are preferred. Um, what, is, what are affective relationships and so on. So I think we uh, really are in a very uh, kind of remarkably different space, but are tending to turn more and more towards uh, older context of nation, uh, uh, nationalism, identity, uh, which have already been dislocated by technologies, um, right? So, uh, so I mentioned, uh, spoke about disembodiment. Uh, I earlier through print, gramophone, photography, cinema. I also want to add to that what is happening to human memory, uh, and a large part of uh, science fiction films and literature will kind of express uh, this anxiety around the erasure of memory. Uh, when memory is erased, history in some sense is erased. Our ability to remember is erased, uh, which we see happening today. Um, memory is outsourced into hard drives, memory sticks. Uh, we rely upon social media platforms like Facebook to actually remember the birthdays of our friends. Um, the Facebook memory prompts bring back to us things that have happened in our life five, 10, four, three years ago. Uh, so something is happening with the capacity for human memory. Um, again, the idea of the clone and the replica. And you know, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, this kind of desire of becoming the ultimate creator, but also the fear of destruction. So what we see happening in a sense is that uh, the human being itself is undergoing a lot of transformation. And this is not an original argument that I'm making. This has been argued uh, in the by uh, theorists and scholars, uh, historians who have studied uh, almost every kind of technological shift and turn, including in the uh, 19th uh, century, uh, the way in which 19th and 20th century, the way in which cinema itself changed human perception. So it was not as if human beings remained intact and cinema was made or created and uh, cinema in turn did not have any impact on people. Uh, so our cognitive capacities, our capacities for perception at every juncture in human history, and this is not a modern thing, it's a uh, it's 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 uh, been present ever since uh, you know in the longer history archaeological historical sense of time let's say uh, undergo transformation so uh, i find this material very fascinating because it allows us to actually uh, understand what is happening to human beings and human society itself through our technological kind of uh, interfaces and interventions uh, right so uh, I'm going to conclude in about five, 10 minutes, but what I want to say is that um, from what I've kind of tried to outline to you, uh, the desire for the human eye and the human limbs to exceed what is normally physically possible uh, through technological developments. Now, um, there is a certain understanding of what is real, what is reality, and how do you represent that reality through any form of expression, whether it's literature, uh, you know, why the novel emerges as the predominant mode of representation at a particular period in uh, European history uh, or Indian history, uh, once we start experimenting with that form, or why the cinema emerges as the predominant mode of expression and representation in the 20th century. Um, I, I think these are important questions to ask and therefore what is the form that is given to the relationship between the real and its representation and I now want to uh, make a proposition with which I will end that if so far our imaging technologies uh, imaging sciences imaging technologies and forms of representation linked to uh, utilizing these uh, to 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 create worlds which are real but are parallel to the real world um, were about actually understanding something that lies outside the human body and mind. Uh, we are now uh, we seem to be at a juncture where imaging technologies will or uh, techno techniques of representation 
are actually going to turn inward inside the human body and they already are uh, in the sense that uh, since we are have now uh, captured many ways of you know capture capturing external reality uh, we will now want to capture what was previously in the realm of psychology uh, particular scientific ways of understand or co cognitive sciences or medical sciences uh, even the creative expressions uh, are going to turn to trying to look within uh, the human body and i will i uh, and the human mind and i'm going to give two examples again i'm going to share two short clips um, but before i i i uh, do that i i'm going to suggest that we have moved from science fiction and what we understood of that genre and everything that the genre does for us to a virtual reality um, where so so the relationship between the science comma fiction and the virtual comma reality are really the kind of philosophical theoretical technological juncture we are uh, inhabiting at the moment um, the second uh, point is that this entity of the human being the mind and the body and its uh, mind's relationship with the body and the mind and body's relationship with the rest of the world society the external world uh, which was based on some kind of cohesiveness or uh, an experience um, something sensory even though it was mediated is now moving towards a dispersed organic inorganic and digital existence that means uh, many of you will have uh, read this essay by donna haraway called the cyborg manifesto where you know the idea of the cyborg that is our minds brains networked existing within a network uh, as some kind of cyborgian entity uh, is something that is not fiction anymore uh, or not just a theory anymore but it's actually the way in which we are living our contemporary lives and um, i would like to propose to all of you who are uh, you know participating in uh, this ftp that if we have to think about new education cinema society and education is the thematic of this um, program uh, and I, I i do believe and i would like to propose that if we have to think of cinema and society and education either through cinema or uh, you know however you uh, in whatever way you want to arrange the relationship between these three terms um, i do believe that we are in requirement of very very new critical theoretical frameworks of understanding this relationship uh, of between cinema society and uh, education uh, and this kind of genre the relationship between science fiction and cinema is one example through which i have try i'm trying to demonstrate why we are actually in a, a very markedly different um, world so i'm going to show you two clips one is um, of an experiment that is being had has been undertaken at the mit uh, media lab and this experiment is that uh, uh, it's a uh, it's it's an experiment to understand how the brain makes sense of visual images that you see so using artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, what they've done is to feed a large number of trailers of films uh and of course it is quite uh, you know not a surprise that they've started with hollywood films and what they've done is uh, the people who are undergoing this experiment who are volunteered to undergo this experiment uh, they are networked to imaging technologies that record the images that their brains have actually uh, generated so what we see with our eyes and what the way in which our brain sees those very images are very different so i'm going to show you uh, what i find a fascinating uh, kind of uh, you know a clip of uh, how the brain is generating paintings that have no relationship to actually what the image is second
Are you still able to see my screen? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, the next clip that I'm showing you, uh, it's actually a series of uh, mini films that were made and uh, the, the information at the beginning of the short film is enough to explain it. So I'll just play it and then we can uh, get into a discussion. Please let me know if you can't hear the sound. Cannot sleep with snoring husband. How to sleep with snoring husband. How to kill mockingbirds. How to kill annoying birds in your yards. Online friendships can be very special. People are not always how they seem over the internet. Houston, Texas is one hot place to live. Gay churches in Houston, Texas. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I mean, you can get the drift of how it goes on, but uh, I wanted to show this because, you know, the first time I saw this, uh, my entire understanding of what cinema was or what documentary was or what science fiction could mean uh, underwent a radical dramatic shift because, uh, um, and this is where I'm going to end in, in some sense by saying that um, going back to the arguments and theories and discussions that were happening uh, at the during the early period of the um, experimentation with cinema in the early part of the 20th century in terms of how can cinema represent reality uh, to you know in, in the best manner and even if you're talking about fictional film a lot of film theory in some sense comes in to allow us to understand how even though it's a fictional story uh, it's actually rendered in a way in which it compels us or urges us to suspend our disbelief, right? Even if you're watching a superhero film or we're watching a film of, uh, which we know is completely fiction, but we tend to want to believe and we tend to believe in it. Uh, and this of course is a huge problem when we are talking about you know, historical films or biopics or uh, even films which just simply say at the beginning of the film that 
this film is based on a true story and um, i've often had these arguments with you know aunts and uncles and uh, you know others uh, who who say that well you know it's based on a true story so that kind of makes it real but we know that cinema is very much a work of fiction whether it's documentary or whether uh, it's uh, what we call as uh, feature fiction films uh, and so i wanted to show end by showing these two clips because when we are talking of science fiction and cinema or we are talking of film theory which is really kind of trying to grapple with how does cinema itself as a medium in some way allow us to understand the world in a way which is quite unique which is not the way in which literature will allow us to understand the world or it's not the way in which theater allows it's, it's there's something quite unique and specific about cinema and so if we are at this juncture in which uh reality itself is dispersed it's a, a networked existence there's a lot of data so i exist as a person but i also exist in the way in which my digital footprint has created me on the internet right facebook's uh, history of uh, what they make of me through my searches or my comments uh, or let's say instagram or whatever else is somebody who is like me but may is not quite me right so we, there's a digital self and there is us as a physical sense self uh, and both of these are intermeshed and integrated and i i'm sure many of you have seen the great hack or uh, the social dilemma and you know the implications of what this dual existence as physical body but also uh, bytes of information data uh, means to the future of our world so what does it mean to the future of our democracies if democracy indeed is going to be the for you know form of governance uh, for the future uh, so i'm going to stop here i've tried to bring together kind of many disparate threads and hopefully they were of some uh, interest or uh, use to uh, all the participants attending uh, this session i'd really like i mean i'd be most grateful if you know people kind of uh, had some comments or responses and um we can take it from there so should i hand it over to the moderators um thank you dr soni for this very very rich talk and i think from the comment section you can also see that you know i mean people are still trying to come to terms with what they've just heard it's um you know because you were really taking us in such different directions and the clips that you've shown as well uh, and the way in which you know when you moved from um science fiction to the i think you were talking about the very uh, sort of early development of science and technology and what that meant and what the sort of uh, human endeavor there was right and and then you moved on to science fiction and our science fiction um especially in films right cinematic uh, sort of use of science fiction uh, changes the way we look at the world changes the way we interpret especially the connection between um uh, to be the other and the human as it were right? the others as much or and i think that's very big part of science fiction uh, whether it's in in a uh, literary form or it's in it's in cinematic form i think that engagement with the others is so very much a part of what science fiction does right and i think you you brought that out really well and you know, the the last section i think is for uh, has everyone really interested you know when you were talking about the technological dispersion of the human self and then how that connects to um, you know cinema as engaged with that uh, dispersion and uh, talk about imaging technologies and how uh, imaging sort of deals with that so i think that there are some questions there as well and we will take them up but um uh, you know before that is that uh, you know anything that you would like to uh, I, i think that because there are some questions on the last bit specifically would you like to talk a little bit more about this dispersion and what it means for us you know when you were talking about cinema is the extension of the senses you know in that sense the eye or um, uh, you know the mind that you stretching it to where it, it wouldn't biologically or physically go right so technology is a way to move that out but now it's actually meant for certain sort of atomization as well right i mean there are bits and pieces of us floating around and and you know and i mean in in bytes and in gigabytes and you know i mean we exist in all kinds of digital forms dispersed through the internet and and it's a very real way to grapple with what cinema was uh, you know what cinema or literature has talked about right the, the human expansion in that sense but it's not really uh, it, it hasn't happened in that sort of uh, 
even in that expansionist sense when we're going out and conquering territories and we're literally as it were an organic way expanding but we are actually breaking down into these multiple parts and we're interacting with other parts in very interesting ways so also that communication with the other that's happening and, and not exactly in the ways that we would want perhaps right uh, so maybe you would like to I, I don't know if that made sense but maybe you could comment a little bit on that and then we can move on to the questions in the chat box yeah thanks metri i think i mean that's a very interesting uh, observation intervention that you're making um, before i kind of directly respond to uh, your uh, comments i just want to say that i'm also a bit of a science fiction fan in some sense right and I think that uh, came across a little bit <laughs> and uh, i do think that uh, historically it's been a genre that has uh, not been given its due and credit in terms of actually the quite complex kind of things that it's trying to do uh, and also you know in, in, a, in a philosophical sense and uh, just like magical realism for example which makes it palatable for people to deal with the disgusting you know dimensions of our world and our society science fiction makes it easier more palatable to deal with everything that we fear about ourselves and dislike about ourselves right so even though uh, we have in historically seen science fiction films or even literature as something that is not uh, is 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 away from our time whether it is time travel into the past or it's time travel into the future or you get onto a spaceship and go somewhere else uh, the fact that it's not our world right it's not uh, but it's a comment on our world that is very cleverly undertaken by letting us think that you know these things are happening somewhere else and so it's science fiction um whereas actually it's always been a critique of our worlds in some sense um so to to respond to your question about uh, you know us existing as dispersed entities uh i think perhaps and i i would really like your responses and the response of the audience on this that historically human beings have seen themselves historically when i say historically i don't mean 200 years or 500 years but in the long history of uh, human kind has been a, always been a contest for survival between the human species and others and uh, at some periods in our history that that has been a collaborative competition right where the relationship has been symbiotic at others it's been aggressive and violent uh but we have gone through all these modes um until in the recent history and when i say use the term history actually use it in its theoretical technical sense of written history of uh knowing because there is a certain point beyond which history fails and only archaeology can take over uh, right archaeology has to come into the rescue of history at the point in which, at, at which history fails and i think these are uh, things that we are uh engaging with in our everyday lives today in the sense of the veracity of history manufactured histories manufactured through then none of this is separate from our discussions of science fiction or uh re the representation of reality and a uh, creation of a virtual reality um so in some sense we've always been dispersed uh in a philosophical sense at least right that consciousness how does consciousness work uh in any religious tradition if you look at uh, you know or uh, i mean spiritual philosophies um there is a theory of some kind of overall consciousness and human being being there for a little time in the world until from the point of birth to death uh, so in that sense i do feel that the dispersal that we are now recognizing and encountering uh, perhaps is a digital dispersal which is not which is very different but it's not entirely different from our, our, our understanding of our ecologies um, if anything in fact it may, makes us pay more attention to the fact that the world the natural world is not merely for human exploitation uh, that and and you know the coronavirus has been a great reminder of this that we can't endlessly go on abusing the uh, environment and the external world and 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 some day we have to at some point we have to give up our ubri of the enlightenment of the industrial age and admit and accept that we are and belong with many others living and non-living organic and inorganic forms um 
and I I do I mean you know uh, Ship of Thieves is a great film to bring up this question of what does it mean if you're if you're uh, donating an organ to somebody else, uh, the person who uses your eyes or your uh, kidney uh, does the essential being of that person change uh, because you know those eyes or those kidneys have had a life outside of that new body uh, right and um, um, this is something that I have thought about quite a lot because my own maternal grandmother when she passed away she decided to donate her, her body to a, 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 a you know medical kind of um, thing so which I thought was remarkably progressive for her uh, time and even for our time but it's it's a question that kind of interests me personally in, in terms of what happens then you know if you're using somebody else's eyes um, and I think the digital dispersal it's premature it's too early we are we aren't even still aware that this is what we are caught up in uh, but we are now a fifth of the 21st century through the 21st century uh, so we're really quite out of the 20th century in some sense and uh, I think that the more we articulate and talk about, you know, how are we going to exist until the end of the 21st century, um, in some sense is, is, is what I'd like to put back out into the room, because I'm sure there are others from different disciplines who have uh, responses to this story. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, that does, definitely doesn't answer yeah. your question, but it's kind of throws the yeah, ball but, back in your court. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think that also kind of answers Raj Lakshmi Kanjilal's question because she was asking me to comment on science fiction and post-humanism, particularly in a multi-species world. And I think you were sort of talking about that, right? And the, the, what is the yeah. role of the human in that sense, uh, you know, in yeah. a world that's yeah. increasing. So, Which um, is really fascinating because, I mean, I teach at the moment, I teach a course on culture and technology and uh, this is to our uh, uh, MA students in uh, literature and cultural studies. And the starting point is always because humanities has kind of some instinctive, you know, rejection of technology, right? And as, so our starting point tends to be a great contest around, oh, no, but technology is doing this to our world, doing that to our world. And then uh, when we actually start looking at what technology means, techne in the way that Heidegger writes about it or uh, otherwise, and you know when when we say that look you guys read literature and uh, anybody who invented the pen invented a technology for expression uh, then things begin to shift at some point in the course i show them this uh, little talk by uh, believe it or not the world first self declared cyborg artist uh, this is a person called neil harbison uh, and uh, he uh, lives in spain uh, but i think he's uh, irish and a man, white man, of course. But um, so, uh, so basically, what he does is that uh, he um, can't see color. Uh, you see, so uh, he uh, worked with some scientists in Spain who have developed a special kind of antenna that he has permanently implanted in his head through a very complicated surgery that had a lot of ethical implications in terms of which doctor will undertake something that has not been tried out like this at all. And what that antenna allows him to do is to convert color into sound. So now if you can think of how radically this alters one's being in the world, because let's say I'm sitting in my study table and I can't tell brown from red or green, but I can constantly hear the sound of brown, the sound of red, the sound of green, and uh, Neil Harbison says that, you know, this was initially when he had this thing implanted into his um, uh, brain, it was very disturbing because he couldn't silence the sound because our world is full of colors, right? So uh, even when it was night and, you know, you, for those of us who can see and whatever, you, you, know, you put out the lights and you can go to bed, but even while sleeping, there was always sound. Uh, but he said he learned to live with it and he actually learned to like his body underwent a change his mind underwent a change and he says now i can uh for me a human being is music or food is music so i create um if i want to hear let's say gangu bai hangal i want to eat a song by gangu bai hangal i will create a melody made of colors that sound like her song right so it's a very i mean it's unimaginable but there are some people who are putting their bodies, I'm not 
suggesting we sh one should do that <laughs> i'm saying that this isn't something that is science fiction these are people yeah. who and and there's a community of art, particularly artists actually who have it's not you know who have lived reasonably long i mean you know they're all around it's not as if you've messed around with your body so much that uh this so yes this is this is what uh, you know in terms of post humanism or even in terms this this desire that i initially outlined of trying to outdo our uh, biological physical capacities for vision time space all of this so now this is another level of converting color to sound or uh, you know things like that uh, so yeah that i think that takes synesthesia to another level right? I mean, but yeah also in terms of just uh, i mean we see technical interventions and medical interventions in other ways in terms of prosthetic limbs or perhaps but this is really altering the very fabric of your being in a very fundamental way right? so i think that becomes very interesting um i think we have quite a few questions here okay so um i think dr sachin mane i think or uh, is asking about the development of scientific temper and if you think science fiction can actually play a role in that yeah uh it's a very interesting question and it's actually a difficult question uh, because uh i think one has to be able to tell the difference between a science fiction and a scientific theorem or a historical fact and it's um uh, uh creative representation uh and i think a scientific temper um well, while science fiction can certainly help it the fact that we introduce the term fiction there or we use the term fiction there or i would even say virtual reality as i said right that um uh it becomes a bit complicated because sure. even documentary films are works of representation there is editing yeah. involved there is framing involved so you are representing things from a certain point of view uh, whereas a scientific temperament i think is something which uh, is sorely needed at this point in time and uh, um, perhaps one can look at science fiction but i don't think that it is uh, i i would suggest that one show a science fiction film to you know say uh what could be interesting is to look at the process behind making a science fiction film so uh, for example i know that you know a lot of filmmakers work with scientists and researchers and actually really try to understand how does a memory work how do you know so i think that's a uh interesting kind of collaboration between uh science and its representation through science fiction films but at the end of the day a science fiction film is a science fiction yeah. film so i want I to really is This, yeah. I think Disney Plus now does a lot of these documentaries where they're looking at the making of the films or the sort of technologies yeah. that have gone into it. So you know, yeah. when you're talking about you know, looking at the process itself, might actually help in developing an interest in the science behind it. But as you're saying, I think, and this is a term that both Sarpa Chattopadhyay also uses, right? I mean, the uh, Bangla term kalpa vikyan. Yeah. I mean, it has kalpana as, or you know, Robert Shul talks about. fictional fictionalizing and sort of countering Suben's point that you know i mean the science part of it is just one bit right and the fiction plays i think just as much of it so something to be careful about uh, and i think uh, when you were talking about it, i think perhaps the crafting of a narrative and how one needs to be sensitive to that uh, dr vinay vikash was also asking this question of uh, i mean trying to draw distinctions between science and history and journalism and you know the making of documentaries for instance i mean how much of it is culling out the facts for instance and how much of it is crafting a narrative and therefore in that sense fiction and you know, are there distinctions that one can draw or you know i mean how do we sort of talk about these very very different fields when you know at their root sometimes uh, you know i mean because science itself can be very subjective right or, you know when we talk about i, I think uh you know this infamous algorithm right that actually saw black people as mm -hmm. uh, primates so in that sense you know i mean coding bias itself i think there's a documentary also on netflix that's just come out right i mean so the fact that we can code our biases or the human element in all of these makes objectivity very difficult right so how how do we deal with that the fact that we draw all of these disciplinary boundaries but they aren't really they aren't as fixed as we would like them to be I I think that that's what Dr. Vikash was trying to ask. 
Okay, I can't actually see the questions in the chat box for some reason, okay. but I'm, so I'm not going to. Uh, no, I, I, there's a problem with my chat box. It's okay. not. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just to respond, I mean, I think uh, what is important here is to uh, very clearly understand that journalism is not literary writing. Uh, journalism does not have the you know creative license to uh, uh, represent things from a subjective point of view. And it's really, in that sense, much more like a legal uh, document or a you know a, a, a kind of legal submission in some sense, where the job of the journalist is to report uh, as objectively as possible. So I would keep journalism out of this entirely. Um, the other two elements, that is narrative and history, I think that's a different kind of uh, argument because, of course, historians' work uh, relies extensively on historical records of documents uh, that can have, uh, you know, some veracity that can be proven that uh, have existed. Much in some sense, like a, a legal a lawyer's work would uh, involve uh, establishing the veracity of a document that has been submitted. Uh, so in that sense, history, while it is a narrative in the sense that one has the liberty of uh, drafting a certain account in ways that uh, it moves you or it doesn't move you or something, you know, uh, there is a literary element, but it is not a work of fiction. History is not a work of fiction. Uh, history is a systematic uh, discipline that has its own methods, uh, which cannot be compromised. Uh, it is dependent on, uh, you know, archives and so on, and we won't get into the realm of oral history right now. But uh, so I would so journalism definitely reject. No, it's not a. It's a narrative. Yes, you have to tell a story, but it's based on certain kind of uh, you know, investigations, history again. And so narrative. Then when we come to narrative per se, I think it's very interesting because narrative becomes then a. Uh, a very powerful tool across uh, disciplines, uh, but also something that we have to break down and critique and understand why are these narratives being constructed in this way, which is, I think, the work that literary criticism does, uh, you know, critical theory teaches us to do. Um, if you're looking at film narratives, then the understanding of the craft of cinema uh, also helps us to understand film narrative. So in that sense, when we're looking at film, I don't think that the plot and story is the narrative of the film, but it's something else. It's the visual representation of that. Right? So. Thank you. Um, Dr. Rajesh Kumar, like from what I can understand of his question, is drawing a distinction between the heroes of science fiction and epic heroes. And he says, if we look at uh, both of them, their possibilities and limitations, can we draw a certain comparison between them? Um, I would think not. Uh, so, you know, I mean, um, there's a lot of this Greek mythological action hero yeah. kind of stuff that is, you know, made into by Marvel into uh, quasi sci-fi, but they're not really sci-fi, they're action hero film. So yeah. an action hero film is very di different from a science fiction film in the sense that in an action hero film, the hero character itself is so heroic that they don't need either science or anything, right? I mean, their human bodies are superhuman bodies. So uh, that's a figment of our imagination. Uh, it's, you know, uh, our human desire to either with, for us to become superhumans, like Nietzsche say, had the idea of a superhuman, or Rubindo Ghosh had uh, an idea of this kind of, you know, super. Uh, uh, being that transcended human um, abilities in some sense, but uh, science fiction, I, I, I would certainly differentiate that from the superhuman epic hero uh, film. Science is about uh, many people, not just about one person. Yeah. Uh, and I think it added an addendum saying, can we read the myth? Can we read mythology and you know the mythical dimension? Is there a mythical dimension to science fiction films? And I think that's, that's what he's added to the question. But I think you've sort of answered that. Yeah, I also. just want to just yeah. add to this that 
uh, I would really keep these quite separate, you know, the epic hero, uh, hero mythical films are a different uh, uh, desire to um, idolize, you know, to put on a pedestal, to look to somebody who is bigger and better than us. I mean, you know, Rajnikanth in that sense is an epic hero or back in the day, Amitabh Bachchan was larger than life. And so this is a different form of that kind of epic hero who uh, represents the people or works for the people in some sense, Superman and, you know, all of that. Uh, whereas science fiction, I think, is, is a very different uh, kind of realm. And I think it's risky and dangerous to mix these mythology is a very different realm altogether uh, yeah and so i will stop with that but i think uh, perhaps we need to really talk about what is mythology and to distinguish it from history and uh, in relationship to the development of the scientific temperament uh, but that i don't think is the work of this session so yeah and i don't know where the time sort of got away from me but maybe just two last uh, quick questions um, i think um, there's a question on uh, Gibson's Sprawl trilogy and whether a uh, human. Uh, uh, yeah, where a computer hacker comes up in, uh, comes up against this powerful artificial intelligence. So, would you like? Uh, you know, the question asks you if you could, um, you know, comment a little bit on this recent development in science fiction that is cyberpunk. And um, the Shibani's question on uh, you know, the role of science fiction um, as playing, uh, uh, I mean, science fiction as important in critiquing the existing world, but do you think recent Hollywood films are not quite up to it or are sort of moving away from that? Uh, you know, maybe if you could just comment on this. And there was one on plasticity and animation. Um, comment on plasticity and animated films or animation as well. Just maybe have, okay, have some quick responses. Two minutes before uh, you yeah. have <laughs> so yeah. so, I think there are three very different uh, questions. So uh, very quickly, I think it was Shibani who asked about whether yeah. films, uh, recent films are actually critiquing society. Yeah. And I think there's a, you know, a mix uh, of both and some the, the risk and danger. And unfortunately, the thing that a lot of SF films succumb to is the uh, reliance on uh, VFX and special effects, and it's almost as if the effects take over the uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, critique or the critical dimension of the film, and um, that needs more time to discuss. But I will link it then to the question on animation uh, and the plasticity, because in some sense, animation and special effects and you know uh, playing around with the image and so on are. Uh, uh, forms of engaging with reality just, just one second with uh, with reality uh, in a, in a different way so sorry this is uh, just you know i mean um, a bit of a rushed answer but i'm saying that the relationship between uh, live action representation that means shooting society outside versus representing it through vfx and animation is a totally different uh, ball game and very interesting in relationship to SF because just as the different space and time allows us to deal with in an in indirect way with our world, I think VFX and animation and so on uh, also enable that. But the risk is that one gets entrapped in, especially the large budget, you know, big budget blockbuster kind of films uh, with merely the effect presenting itself rather than representing anything. There was a third question which uh, I have cyberpunk. Yeah, which is a very you know kind of uh, niche form of engaging with. It. It's almost like an aesthetic and political way of engaging with uh, these contexts. So I'm sorry, I'm having to rush through a lot of. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. I should have been a better moderator and actually marshal these questions and put them across to you sooner. So I really apologize to everyone whose questions. Uh, 
uh, you know, I, I could not sort of forward. Uh, but thank you so much for this wonderfully nuanced session. I think, you know, I mean, because we had a somewhat slow start, but then questions really started piling on. I think people just sort of, you know, were actually beginning to engage more and more with all of this material that you actually put before us. You know, and it takes a little bit of time to unpack it and sort of wrap one's head around it. But thank you so much. I think people are going to, you know, I mean, going to derive uh, pleasure and continue to learn from your work and, and this recording is going to be up on YouTube. So I think we'll keep sort of you know, taking from it. It, it was, was such a rich vein that we actually uncovered here. So thank you so much, Dr. Sonia, for being here today and for, uh, for making this so very engaging for all of us. Uh, on behalf